It's the early hours of the 6th of June, 1944. On a naval vessel sailing across the English Channel, two men ponder the consequences of a coin toss. Their regiment has been selected as one of the first assault units to storm a certain beach in Normandy to open a third front in a German-occupied Europe. And a simple coin toss has decided that the companies led by these two brothers-in-arms will be the very first to dash off the landing crafts and brave the enemy fire. But Charles and Elliot share more than the same uniform. They share the same surname. They are not just brothers-in-arms. They are brothers, periods, and best friends as well. Major Charles Dalton and Major Elliot Dalton have accepted the cruel orders of fate. They will lead them into battle, possibly victory, almost certainly death. And they know that one of them, heck, probably both of them, will not return home. This is the kind of story that you might expect in a Hollywood blockbuster, with rugged yet humane heroes facing unsurmountable odds against the backdrop of an American flag waving in the winds. But this is not a movie script, this is history. And the Dalton brothers do not fight under a Stars and Stripes banner, but under a red maple leaf. This is the story of the Juno Beach landings, when Canada storms the shores of Normandy. On the 6th of June 1944, D-Day, U.S. General Dwight D. Eisenhower launched the first phase of Operation Overlord, the invasion of Western Europe to open a third front against Nazi Germany, already engaged against the Allies in the Soviet Union and Italy. The first phase of the operation consisted of an assault on the coastline of Normandy, northern France. This was to be the largest seaborne invasion in history. A total of 156,000 U.S., British, and Canadian troops, supported by naval artillery and airborne troopers, who were tasked with forming heavily defended beaches to secure a coastal bridgehead. From there, the Allies could amass reinforcements and supply trains before pouring southwards to liberate France. The forces committed by Canada to the D-Day landings were smaller in comparison to the British and US troops involved, but it was a considerable contingent anyhow, especially in proportion to the demographics of the country. In total, 14,000 Canadian soldiers and paratroopers stormed Normandy, all volunteers from the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division and the 2nd Armoured Brigade. They were supported by 110 vessels of the Royal Canadian Navy manned by some 10,000 sailors. From above, the Royal Canadian Air Force contributed with 15 fighter and fighter-bomber squadrons. The Canadians were to land on an 8-kilometer stretch of beach codenamed Juno, defended by two battalions of Germany's 716th Infantry Division. Juno Beach was sandwiched between Sword to the east and Gold to the west. Both beaches would be stormed by the British. Further to the west lay Omaha and Utah to be attacked by the United States. The objectives of the Canadians were to establish a bridgehead on Juno by neutralizing German defenses concentrated mainly around three towns. From east to west, these were St. Auburn, Bernier, and Courcelles. The latter expected to be particularly a tough cookie due to the presence of strong artillery batteries. After silencing these guns, the 3rd Infantry Division and the 2nd Armoured Brigade were to proceed up to 18 kilometers inland to secure the KPK airfields and the railways linking Caen. To Bayeux. The German defences along the Normandy stretch of the so-called Atlantic Wall were strong, but not as strong as they could have been. Operation Fortitude, an ingenious disinformation campaign, had convinced the German high command that the Allies would attempt a landing in Calais with minor diversionary tactics in Normandy. The first phase of Operation Overlord kicked off on the 5th of June 1944 at 233100 hours with an intensive aerial bombardment of the German coastal batteries. By 5.15 the next morning, the Royal Canadian Air Force Group and its allies had dropped 5,268 tons of bombs. That night, French resistance saboteurs, alerted by coded message on the BBC, launched more than a thousand actions, sowing chaos and disruption behind enemy lines. At midnight, the recently formed 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion, commanded by Brigadier James Hill, kicked into action. The 1st Battalion was dropped north of Caen to secure the eastern flank of Sword Beach. Due to high winds and intense anti-aircraft fire, the three companies of the battalion were scattered across a much larger area than expected and lost most of their heavy guns. Nonetheless, they achieved their objectives Company A captured an artillery battery in Merville, which directly threatened Juno, and Company B blew up a bridge in Roberhon. Company C apparently had pulled the shortest straw as they had to neutralize their most formidable objective, a garrison at Varaville, protected by bunkers, trenches, and a 75mm anti-tank gun. Despite losing their own artillery, the men of C succeeded in storming the chateau, covering their assault with mortar fire.
On the early morning of the 6th of June, the sky was overcast, strong winds blew from the northwest, and waves rose up to two meters high. The weather on the channel and on Juno Beach was far from ideal, but there was no stopping D-Day the beginning of the end. At 5.30 a.m., naval destroyers unleashed a barrage on the German coastal defenses. Then the 31st minesweeper flotilla of the Royal Canadian Navy cleared the waters in front of Juno, laying lanes of buoys to indicate safe passage. Next, it was time for the men of the 3rd Division and 2nd Armoured Brigade to pour out over Juno's sands, carried by dozens of landing crafts or LCAs. The swarms of LCAs rolled through choppy waters amidst a storm of steel, fire, and shrapnel pouring out from the German fortifications. Men were tossed around like crash test dummies as they succumbed to waves of fear, adrenaline, vomit. The LCAs were closely followed by 24 LCTs or landing craft tanks. These were specially designed amphibious assault crafts designed for landing armored vehicles. Not just any vehicle, but the duplex drive tanks, also known as DD tanks or Donald Duck tanks. These were equipped with flotation devices and propellers, which should have allowed them to negotiate the muddy shores and reach the beaches ahead of the infantry. At Juno, the 24 LCTs carried also four artillery regiments for a total of 96 guns with a caliber of 105 millimeters. For one hour, hour and a half, the artillery units pounded the German fortified positions at Saint-Aubin, Bernier, and Corseu, offering covering fire for their friends on the LCAs as they reached the shore. The first unit to reach the shore were the troops of the 7th Infantry Brigade tasked with assaulting Corseu. The German strong point stationed there was defended by six field guns, 12 machine gun pillboxes, and fortified mortar nests. When the 7th landed, the high tide had submerged most of the German defensive obstacles, hiding them from view. As a result, 30% of the LCAs were destroyed or damaged. The men of the 7th pressed on nonetheless, losing almost 50% of their unit in the first waves of the assault. Despite the nighttime bombardments and the naval barrages, it seemed as though the Germans had maintained all their firepower. All they could do was run as fast as they could toward their objectives. 19-year-old Francis William Gordon later recalled the experience, crawl and run and crawl and run. And one thing you couldn't do was stop on Juno Beach. If your buddies got hurt, you couldn't stop. You had to keep going. If you stopped, well, you were a dead duck too. So you had to keep going. Which was a hard thing to do because the beach was something like ketchup. That's how blood red the beach was. To make matters worse, the infantry was expecting support from the Donald Ducks, but most of the amphibious tanks were launched too far away from the shore. From that position, they could offer little cover. Many were even swamped by the tall waves. But where tanks and heavy artillery failed, the men of the 7th Brigade compensated with ingenuity, grit, and a bit of luck. Take the case of Lieutenant Bill Grayson, company commander with the Regina Regiment. While his company uh, was pinned down by machine gun fire and artillery, Grayson managed to advance, taking cover behind a house facing the sea. From there, he took note that only one machine gun position stood between him and the strongest enemy artillery battery, the 88mm gun position. He also took note that the German and machine gunner fired bursts at regular breaks. Taking advantage of the intervals, Grayson sprinted toward the pillbox and chucked a hand grenade through the aperture. The German inside managed to escape, zigzagging through a network of trenches toward the main pillbox, which serviced the deadly 88mm. Grayson gave chase, pistol in hand, and burst into the fortification. Taken by surprise and probably expecting a larger force, 35 German soldiers surrendered immediately to the lone Canadian gunman. Grayson was awarded the military cross thanks to this feat, which allowed the rest of his company to clear the strong point. To the east, the town of Bernier was taken by the men of the Queen's Own Rifles. This is where our friends, the Dalton brothers, saw action. The rifles landed ashore at 8.12 a.m., harassed by heavy machine gun fire. They too had been left unprotected by the Donald Ducks. Nonetheless, their first assault wave raced 200 meters forward, taking out two large field guns. Shortly after 9 a.m., the rifles were joined by the self-propelled guns, or SPGs, of the 19th and 14th Artillery Regiments. But the increasing number of vehicles jamming Juno Beach made it difficult for the SPGs to maneuver. The rifles would have to face without artillery cover, also their next obstacle, a sea wall reinforced by pillboxes and concrete bunkers from where the Germans fired their MG42 machine guns and mortars. 65 casualties were claimed by a single machine gun emplacement alongside the sea wall, which had pinned down B Company. Company commander Major Charles Dowson tried to silence the pillbox with carefully aimed shots from his stand submachine gun. He realized that he could not fire directly into the slits on the pillbox walls. Instead, he climbed onto a ladder positioned against the sea wall. From there, he fired at an angle against the machine gun shields placed in front of the fortification, hoping that his bullets would ricochet inside the emplacement. The staring tactic seemed to pay off as the German gunners fell silent for a minute. Before Dalton could celebrate, a German officer stepped out of the pillbox and fired with his service pistol. 
The bullet perforated Charles's helmet and struck his head. Luckily, the slug glanced off his skull. After a medic bandaged him, Charles decided to take care of the machine gun position for good. Revolver in hand, he sprinted toward the enemy, running into the blind spot of the German gunner's vision. He managed to reach the back of the pillbox and try the handle of the entrance door. Surprisingly, the soldiers inside had not bolted it shut. That sealed their fate. Dalton kicked open the door and fired his revolver, taking out the German gunners. For this action, Major Charles Dalton was awarded the Distinguished Service Order. While B Company was clearing the sea wall defences, A Company was also making progress under the command of Charles's brother, Major Elliot Dalton. The spearhead of their attack was the squad led by Sergeant Charles Martin. Flanked by riflemen Betridge and Shepard, Martin took out an enemy machine gun nest before they encountered a barbed wire fence. Laying low, Martin threw his wire cutters to Betridge and asked him to throw them to Shepard. Shepard was supposed to brave enemy fire to cut an opening in the barbed wire. With typical Canadian politeness, Shepard shouted to Betridge, You tell him to f himself. He's making more money than we are. He had a point. Martin decided to ignore the insubordination and cut through the fence himself, leading what was left of his platoon into the Bernier train station. There, Martin's men faced a dilemma. Targeted by MG42 volleys, they had to run to clear the area. But if they ran, they risked stepping on one of the many landmines. In a surreal moment, Martin's platoon decided to walk slowly across the station, praying that a bullet put them out of their misery before a landmine blew them to pieces. Somebody listened to Martin's prayers just as he stepped on a landmine. A slug pierced his helmet. By sheer miracle, he was not wounded, and the impact of the shot was so strong it knocked him out of the blast's way. After more than an hour of hard combat, the Queen's own rifles, reinforced by Quebec's Regiment de la Chaudière, broke through the German defences and entered Bernier. With more than 60 killed in action, this was the single costliest engagement on Juno Beach. The easternmost sector of Juno Beach was the battleground for the North Shore Regiment, which landed at 8 10 hundred hours. One of the first men to set foot on the sand was 21-year-old Lieutenant Fred Moore. As soon as the doors of his landing craft swung open, he led his men into a mad dash towards the village of Saint-Bain. As he recalls, they were surrounded by mortars falling, bullets and shells exploding, smoke everywhere. Somehow, through this rain of death, I reached the seawall. I lost several men before we reached it. But that was just the beginning of the carnage. In a predicament experienced by all landing parties, Moore's company realized that the preliminary artillery barrage had done little damage to the German defenses. A fortified position by the seawall, still intact, was pounding the North Shore Regiment with 50mm anti-tank shells, MG42 bursts, and mortar rounds. The men in the saint Orban sector, however, were luckier than their brothers-in-arms elsewhere on Juno, as they could count on close artillery support. They were supported by a 6-pounder anti-tank gun, two inch mortars and later even by Donald Duck tanks and armored vehicles of the Royal Engineers. The latter were armed with the devastating petard mortars firing flying dustbin demolition rounds. The petards took out the 50mm gun emplacement and several pillboxes, but more German defenders seemed to pour out of nowhere. Later, it was discovered that the fortifications at saint aubin were supplied via a network of hidden tunnels. Eventually, the Germans seemed to give up, and several white flags appeared on their positions. But it was a trap. As soon as the Canadians approached to take the enemy prisoner, they opened fire again. The Canadian armor moved in again, targeting the treacherous enemy. White flags appeared again later in the day, but as the regiment's historian wrote, the North Shore had had enough of that trickery and went in with bombs, cold steel, and shooting. They inflicted many times the casualties the enemy had inflicted on them and cleaned out the place. The main positions had been overrun by 11.15. The North Shore Regiment poured into Salba and proceeded to methodically mop up every last German soldier, an operation which was concluded only that evening. All the units landed at Juno Beach were moving inland by around noon that day. Now that the shores were cleared, the reserves of the 3rd Division were consolidating their hold on the bridgehead. We will not go into the details of the following actions of the Canadian Armed Forces in Europe, but we may cover them in the future if you let us know you want to hear that in the comments below. In brief, the Canadians distinguished themselves, fighting alongside their US and British allies in Normandy. They first endured violent counterattacks by SS Panzer Divisions, which had been redeployed from Calais. After resisting the onslaught, the Canadians fought back again, pursuing the enemy out of Normandy. After 76 days of bitter struggle in northern France, the Canadians participated in the liberation of Belgium and the Netherlands before invading Germany. But let's remain focused on the aftermath of D-Day itself and how it affected two of our protagonists antagonists the Dalton brothers. After single-handedly taking out a German pillbox, Charles had been taken to a field hospital. The rounds to his head had only grazed his skull, but he had suffered a serious concussion nonetheless and was breathing profusely. That very morning, he had pondered with his brother Elliot which one of them was doomed not to return. As he lay in his hospital bed, he suppressed tears when he heard that Elliot had indeed been killed 
near Bernier. Luckily, it was just a rumor. Elliot had survived, and while regrouping with his company after the battle, word had gotten to him that it was Charles who had actually died. Mercifully, both Dalton boys had survived the ordeal, but many more had not been so lucky. In less than 10 hours of fighting, the 3rd Infantry and the 2nd Armoured Brigade had suffered 1,074 casualties, of which 359 were killed. The adversaries of the 716th Division had lost almost 6,000 men, killed or captured. The contribution of the Canadians to the D-Day landing is often overlooked, at least outside of their home country, overshadowed by the large deployments of forces at Omaha, Utah, Sword and Gold. But what they lacked in quantity, they surely more than compensated for in quality. As the D-Day landings drew to their conclusion, the Canadian forces had managed to advance quite deeply toward the town of Creuly, Colombie, sur thion and Annecy. Their furthest advance point was still roughly nine kilometers away from their main assigned target, the Carpacay airfield. Nonetheless, the Canadian landing should be considered a resounding success, as they had pushed further south than any other Allied units on D-Day. 